Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I, will, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So shall we pray? And ask God to help us. Heavenly Father, as we come and look at these words of Jesus, as he perhaps goes to places we feel a bit uneasy talking about, please, Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts that are open, that we may see his words are good and long to live them out. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when I was 16, I had the great pleasure of working in a newsagent's um, and uh, they were the days before scanning stuff. So still to this day, I can remember the prices of the chocolate bars. Unsurprising, some of you who know me may be. Um, and I remember the day when a Freddo was only 10p. Believe it or not, a Freddo is now 25p. 
25p for 10p's worth of chocolate. That is outrageous. Two and a half times the, the, the price rise. I know there will be some of you that can tell me, I remember when it was three, three pounds and uppence or whatever it was. Or the Mars bar that used to be 30p that's now 60p. Or you may even have heard of the outrage that came when Toblerone increased the distance between its hills. It took out the chocolate in the middle and there was outrage. How dare they um, do that? You notice that companies are really clever as they start to reduce the size of their packaging so that now by, by soon we'll have a bag of crisps for 50p with air and one crisp in it. But that outrage, isn't it, at the the rising costs isn't just something we feel of looking back. And by the way, if you're a teenager here, it will come to you. You will start to grumble about how a 25p Freddo is now 50p. We know it all too well, don't we? In a year where the cost of fuel has gone up 40%, where the energy cap seems to no longer be a cap, but just something that pr prompts a price rise. Where the fact that locally, if you're in your 20s, 30s, even 40s or 50s now, even if you have a good job, you can't afford a house unless family or friends help you out. When the reality is that even food banks are being used by people with jobs. And when people like Peter, working with Christians Against Poverty, are finding the need for their help rise significantly. Friends, we're either super godly or we have a load of cash stashed under our mattress if our current times don't unsettle us. But it's not just these times that may unsettle us, is it? It's not just when things seem to be hard that worries about money may be in our heads and our hearts. Roll back a little bit to the 80s and 90s. Where the, cost of, where the price of houses doubled overnight, where everything seemed to be on an upward trend of, of salaries rising and life improving. Come back to, with me to being a child of the 80s and 90s, perhaps even more beforehand, and you being told that if you did well at school and got good grades, you could go to a good university and get a good degree where you could then get a good job that pays a good salary and buy a good house in a good place so that you can build up for a good retirement. Friends, that is the oxygen still of our world. If you don't believe me, come on a Saturday or an evening in the week and see the number of tuition groups that come here as parents are desperate for their children to pass the 11 plus so that they can go to a good school and get good grades so that they can then go to a good university and get a good degree, that they can get a good job in a nice house, in a nice place so they can get a nice retirement. It seems to be a race to what? Have a cushy end of life? And in the midst of thinking about that strife and worries of life, Jesus is asked a question about money where he's asked to play, verse 13, the executor or the solicitor. And his reply isn't to deal with whether who should have what, but he wants to ask a question about what is life? What is it? Rachel, there should be one of our screens where that question comes. It's a big question, isn't it? It's a question that my children seem to ask me 10 minutes after they should be in bed or whilst they're driving and I can't really concentrate. Is it really all about money and stuff? Is it all really a race to get a comfortable retirement? Well, Jesus' answer comes at the end in verse 34. What's life all about? Well, it's where your treasure is. Can you see? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here's what you'll be living for and chasing and wanting. It, it, we would have thought, wouldn't we, that it'd be the other way around. You know, if, uh, where your heart is. If you're passionate about classic cars and postage stamps, we would go to your house and look in your garage and find three Bentleys and four Aston Martins, and we find your albums with all your various stamps from all across the world tucked inside. Well, we'd think it would be that way, wouldn't we? That our hearts lead to what we spend. But Jesus is a little bit deeper. He says, no, 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 where your treasure is, 
there your heart is also. Right, where your treasure is. How many cars you drive. How much money you spend. What possessions are precious to you. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. If you're a Christian here today, it's a pretty throwing question, isn't it? That's where your heart is. I know the risk is for me. I see the wonders of how technology can improve my life. And then funnily enough, I find that I've invested in things that I think will make my life better. Where my treasure is, there my heart will be also. It's that big question that leads Jesus to what he wants us to do. Where does he want our treasure to be? Where does he want our hearts to be? What does he want our life to be about? And the answer to that comes right in the middle of verse 31. Here's the only thing we need to remember as as we listen to Jesus here. Verse 31, seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Seek his kingdom. Focus your heart on God and his kingdom. That's what you need to do. Focus your heart on God and his kingdom. See, if you were at school and you used to sing, you'd probably know. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's a very jolly tune, isn't it? And his righteousness. It's a damn hard thing to do. We're going to see. You see, because what Jesus has been saying to us as we've looked through these chapters of Luke, time after time has come this refrain. Wholehearted, committed. That's what it means to follow Jesus. You follow in my footsteps, says Jesus. You're going to be those who, like me, look and pray, go and speak. You're going to be those who share Jesus with others. You're going to be walking demonstrations of my love to the world. And today you're going to be those who invest in my kingdom. And so thankful this Stewardship Sunday... For the many ways, dear friends, that you focus your heart on God and his kingdom. For the way you give freely of your time, of your talents and skills, of your your treasures. Without you, none of this could happen. We wouldn't be a growing family where God transforms lives through Jesus. So hear me say this, thank you. But this word seek is not a one-off doing. It's an ongoing word. In fact, it's not a passive word. It needs to be an active word. You'll know that if you've played the game hide and seek. If you're the seeker, you know that you need to keep seeking until you find. If you get bored or someone asks you to do something else, you stop seeking, don't you? Someone who suddenly realized that actually the children have hidden in all quarters and it's gone quiet. Oh, this would be a good time to have a sit down and five minutes peace. It's the same with this command of Jesus. We need to keep going, being, seeking, focusing our heart on God and his kingdom. But perhaps just like me, you go, well, what does that mean, Jesus? Well, he tells us three ways that we focus our heart on God and his kingdom. They come with two don'ts and one do. Here's the first. Don't be a practical atheist. Don't be a practical atheist. It's what he says in verse 15 to 21. Because he tells this story of a, of a rich man. Perhaps he, who could have well, we could well have seen up in the equivalent of the city of London. A man who looks at his seven-story building with eight basements and goes, Oh no, this is not big enough for all my crops. I won't share them with people. I will tear it down and build another bigger place. I need more space to take in more crops. Why? Look, verse 19. I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things. Well done, you. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Do you see his aim? To retire as early as he physically can. Perhaps that might be some of ours at the moment with all that work is throwing at us. If only, if only. But that's what he longs for. That's what he's building and doing. I mean, it's slightly hilarious, isn't it? He could have moved his barns and given his barns to someone else in need. He could have given his excess grain to a local food bank. But look, that's not the kick in the teeth for this man. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool. You fool. 
I should have rung terror in his heart. Because the psalm speaks of the fool says in his heart there is no God. And that's exactly what this man has done, isn't it? This very night, verse 20, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? If at school you look to the Egyptians, you'll know this, don't you? As they buried it in their tombs, all their possessions with them, hoping that they would set them up for the afterlife. We know that as the archaeologists have gone in, the large golden pole or the snake mantelpiece that was buried with them is still there. It doesn't come with you. In fact, it doesn't help you beyond this world. But that's even not quite the big problem. Verse 21, this is how anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. Do you see what this man's been doing? He's been living as though the only thing that matters is him and his stuff. Stuff, God. Oh, I'm immortal. I'm young. I'm going to live forever. And does God care? <laughs> Probably not. And then he dies. And his stuff is gone and he stands before God and God says, how have you been rich towards me? Uh, Jesus says, if we live for this world alone, if we live just for ourselves and building bigger barns, then we are foolish. We are foolish. Perhaps you're here today and you're not a Christian. Friends, do you see how life lived for this alone? It may mean you get to have a nice watch or a bigger car, but is that really what life is all going to entail? I've stood at many a funeral and we haven't lauded and praised them for the size of the bank balance. We've been talking about the person and character they were. Don't be a practical atheist living for stuff. No, it's foolish. In fact, as he then turns to his disciples, Jesus, he wants them to realize that as you allow God into your world, you need to do another don't. Here's the second one. Don't worry about stuff. Your Father will provide. You see, because as we worry in today's world, don't we? Will we have enough food on the table? Will we have enough money in the bank? Worry just seems to be a natural thing of living in this world, doesn't it? But it needn't be in Jesus' world. Corrie ten Boom, a wonderful Christian lady of the past, said this. Worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling around a center of fear. Worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts whirling around a center of fear. Do you see what's at the heart of worry? Fear, frightened. If I don't think about how we have food on the table and pay the bills, then what's going to happen? We'll be homeless. We won't have anything to eat. I'll lose face. My kids will think ill of me. I just will be in the gutter. It's fear of it all being taken away. But do you see how worry is a cycle of inefficient thoughts? Because she goes on to say, worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It doesn't do anything for the future. It only saps today of its joy. Worry never robs tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its joy. And as those followers of Jesus, he longs that you and I would not have the, the uh, joy-sapping moments of worrying about what we have. Because look, he, he starts to list off a whole load of examples of why your Father will provide. Look, verse 24, consider the ravens. And let, let's start with the beautiful birds. No, let's start with the lowest of the low, the big, ugly black ones, the ones that just make loud sounds. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, verse 24, yet God fears them, feeds them, sorry. I think I could have given Jesus credit if he said, let's start with a robin or a blue tit. Ah, oh, they're lovely and cute and cuddly. He starts with the bottom. God even feeds the ravens. So how much more valuable are you than birds? Much more valuable than the ravens. He longs to provide for you. If you're someone that's trusting in Jesus, he's given his own son for you. Don't you think he'll ensure that he feeds you? 
In fact, verse 25, worry does you no good. Who can worry and can add a single hour to his life? You can't. The, the rich fool had to remember that, didn't he? He thought he'd live forever. He needed to learn that God controls when his life comes and when it goes. Don't worry about it. You can't control it. In fact, look, look at the lilies. See how God provides there as well. These beautiful lilies. They're even better than the best dressed man in the Old Testament, Solomon, who had all the riches of the world at his feet. The lilies are better than the riches and lavishment of Solomon because God clothes the grass of the field. You see how beautiful and precious God's care is? How much more, dear friend? Is he going to care for you? That's why he can say, verse 29, do not set your heart on what you eat and drink. Don't worry about it. The pagan world, verse 30, needs to worry about it. They've got no one in their world to provide for them. They've got to do it all themselves. But end of verse 30, your father knows that you need them. He knows what you need. He will provide. He will provide. That's why another Christian said this, worry is nothing but practical infidelity. The person who worries reveals his lack of trust in God and that he is trusting in himself. What our loving Father wants us to do is not worry but trust him, dear friends. A life of focusing our heart on God will be one that trusts him. That's why he says, verse 31, seek his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. Trust me. Trust me. It's lovely to hear of Nikkei's story of God's doing just that. But Nikkei's story isn't a one-off fluke. He does it time after time after time again. Grab Si and Pip over lunch and hear of God's provision for them as they seek first his kingdom. See throughout the ages God do this time and time again. As his people focus their hearts on him, as they don't worry, he provides. Friends, do you need to stop trusting yourself and trust your heavenly Father? As stewardship Sunday, do you need to focus your heart by not worrying, but by looking to him? Because as well as not worrying, thirdly, here's what we are to actually do. It comes in the last two verses. Do invest your stuff in God's kingdom. Do invest your stuff. Here we go, verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Now, he's not encouraging us all to, here to be homeless and then become more of a problem. He's demonstrating that we're not living for this world alone like the rich fool. We're to give in abundance, even giving all the way that we have to those that need it. It's not consumed with myself, it's consumed with others. That's what it means to invest in God's kingdom. It doesn't mean build a barn for me, it means to give away to bless other people. So much so that we'll, we will then have wallets that will never wear out. Look, verse 33, provide purses for yourself that will not wear out. As it were, like a, a bucket of money that no matter how much you keep giving out, there still seems to be stuff in the bottom. Why is that? Not that God is an Aladdin, uh, sorry, a genie in a lamp, but he's investing in a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. God's in the economy of dealing with a currency of investing in his eternal kingdom. And as you and I invest, as we invest in his stuff, he uses that for eternal gain. Where a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes and no moth destroys. Friends, as you invest in providing money that allows us to employ a James Miller to work amongst our children and young people, as James then has the time and energy and skills to go running and seeking after the loss of the children and youth, you are investing in eternal heavenly things. As a young person, may at the gates of heaven say thank you to you for how you invested in them. 
Or how being part of a church, how the money that you give to us here, some of that goes to fund Sai and Pip working in Asia, working amongst Muslims. How someone will be able to turn to you and say, thank you, that the way you invested in them has borne eternal, lasting results. Or investing in God's kingdom of loving our neighbours or looking after people of sharing our lives and sharing the gospel. As you go to your workplace, and don't just become consumed by your work, but start to think of those around you as you love your neighbor, as they start to see you and the Christian faith differently, as you prayerfully speak of the Lord Jesus, you are investing in eternal things with your time. You see, very often on a stewardship Sunday, we think, they only want my wallets. When Jesus is world, he wants all of you. Whether you're here, whether you're at home, whether you're at work with family and friends or hobbies, every day, every moment, you have a choice to invest in God's kingdom. To build up a bigger barn for yourself or to invest in others. To seek his kingdom. To trust him. So the simple question comes for us, friends, will we take Jesus at his word? Will we trust him? Do we really believe, verse 31, that if we focus our heart on God and his kingdom, well, we don't need to be a practical atheist. We don't need to worry about stuff. We can invest in his kingdom, knowing that he will provide, and it is worth it. Don't let the foolish pursuit of stuff here on earth rob you of the joy It can be yours of investing in his kingdom. So thank you for the way you do that, friends. I'm sure in ways unseen, as most of our lives are spent beyond this building. And as we think again this Sunday, may you prayerfully seek, what does that mean for me in all of my life? And what might that mean for me here? How might that mean I can invest my talents in serving with the children, with the AV guys at the back? How might that mean I could give of my time to a, to a life group to both be nourished and encouraged and to give to others, even though it costs me? How might it be I can use the treasures that God has given me to enable so much to happen amongst this church family? See, because what we long as a church is what Jesus longs, that his kingdom will be built to be a growing family where God transforms lives through Jesus. And he does that as he transforms you and I to focus our hearts on God and his kingdom and to invest in his kingdom for all eternity. Let me pray. Loving Father, we thank you that you are a God who here has promised to love and care for us, those who are trusting in your Son. Father, forgive us where we worry, where we chase after building bigger barns. Lord, in your grace, help us to trust you. And may you help us to not worry, but to invest in your eternal kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.